Hello and welcome back to Choir with Knut. Uh, today we are looking at choral harmonization. And I've got with me Jitin today. How are you, Jitin? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Thank you. Now, Jitin, you've done some choral harmonization before, haven't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was this uh, for university or like a grade or what was the setting? Yeah, I did it for grade mainly for my grades oh for grades um, yeah so that's is that an abrsm grade is that like what we have in the uk yeah yeah exactly okay yeah, yeah abs yeah so i think for a lot of people uh who do music theory they they might actually first encounter chorales when doing grades um but i um, i found that chorales are really really useful or knowing how to write in the chorale style is really useful for me and my you know, professional work. So I thought it'd be useful to cover it. And also, you know, for anyone watching who's got a chorale assignment to do, this might be helpful for them as well. So, uh, as usual, I want to start by looking at a bit of history. Now, Jitin, what exactly is chorale harmonization? What can I say for that? Pardon? Um, <laughs> for one second, just let me kind of a like a it's kind of a traditional like a art writing section it's uh sorry, sorry sorry could you re repeat what you said sorry <laughs> kind of harmonizing in yeah a four part yeah exactly corral uh i can write i'm gonna share my screen with you by the way because my my viewers can see this but you can't but i'm gonna share because you will probably want to know what uh suggest that one share computer sound e d d d d there we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Lovely. All right. So, choral harmon harmonization. Yeah, it's basically just a technique for harmonizing. Um, give me a bullet point. Uh, and it's usually used for choir music. And then kind of that co comes from choral, which is another word for saying choir. But we don't use it exclusively for choir. We can use it for anything. It's used quite often in jazz music for the uh, the saxophone and brass sections, and you find it used, you know, for strings a lot. Like it's very, it's a very common technique for uh, for harmonizing. So, when exactly did choral harmonization become a thing? Like when 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 did people write the first choral harmonizations? You think? I think it was mainly popularized by Bach. Yeah, Bach is uh, very important in the popularization, but it actually, it did start before Bach. Uh, so kind of, the, you see the first uh, chorale harmonizations um, were written around the late Renaissance. So that's uh, the the big time in history in Europe where you had a lot of big movements in art and science and all sorts of things. Uh, you could say that it may be sort of 1500s until say mid 1700s is when the chorale harmonizations were at their height. And as you say, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach was one of the big proponents of chorale harmonization. He was very, very good at doing them. So because of that, was very good, very good at um, chorales. So we sometimes call them Bach chorales. But he certainly wasn't. He certainly wasn't the first person to do chorales. This was something that came before. Uh, now, but do we still use them today? I mean, I, this is something that happened around the Renaissance and the Baroque periods. Um, is this something still in use? Yeah. Yes, is the answer. Absolutely. Still in, oops. Absolutely. And, you know, I did kind of say at the top that I, <laughs> I still use choral harmonization a fair bit. Um, and, um, of course, we don't use them maybe exactly as they did back in the Baroque and Renaissance because their music sounded quite different. But you can still take a lot of techniques that they used and apply them to modern music and you get stuff that sounds really good. Okay, 
So to understand why chorales sound like they do, we need to look at exactly what was going on in the music. And of course, this was all happening in Europe. So it will be the music of Europe right around the time when they started to become big. So what were the things happening in music during sort of the late Renaissance where well, that would inform how, you know, chorales became a thing? Do you, have a, do you have an idea? It's fine if not. <laughs> uh, maybe the hymns, the church. Yeah, so absolutely. At the time, a lot of big kind of movements in music was happening around the church because the church had a lot of money. So they had the, the money to fund artists and they would then try and push the boundaries. So it was definitely something that came out of church music as the church had money to fund artists um, and yeah and you know Bach was a very very devout church musician and basically wrote a thousand cantatas all about you know religion so uh, so yeah it's uh, it's significant but uh, more broadly speaking even beyond what was going on in church music what was the type of music that was popular during the renaissance Baroque. Um, so, uh, sorry, could you repeat what we said? The Baroque. Baroque. Well, Baroque is the kind of the, the name we give to the, the time period. But the type of music that was popular, we, we kind of have an umbrella term for it. It's the kind of music that, for instance, uh, you, motets, madrigals, that kind of music. We have like an umbrella term for it. Do you know what it is? No, okay. So at the time, polyphonic music was a big deal. I feel like I write so poorly when I'm doing the stream. <laughs> it must look like I've got <laughs> like I've got dyslexia, but I really don't. Uh, yeah, polyphonic music was a big deal. There's stuff like madrigals, which were secular, and motets, which were sacred. So these were essentially kind of the same thing, just with different subject matter. So polyphonic music was a big influence on chorale harmonization. And what did um, what did chorales change? How are they? So I'll, uh, let's listen to two examples. And these are both from the Renaissance. So they'll both kind of fit within that time. Yeah, we'll just stop it there. So what, uh, can you just tell me some features of this music? It doesn't have to be anything really detailed, just what's a general feature of this music? Uh, it felt like a church hymn. Yeah, well, it's, it is definitely a church hymn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what was happening in the music? Was it a very kind of, uh, was it a static kind of music or was it a lot of movement? What was going on? Uh, not so much movement, I felt, but... Uh... Mm. Uh, maybe kind of followed a kind of a progression type, like a repeating. Yeah, I mean, we are kind of we were seeing there's something that's being repeated for sure. So this uh, this music is like uh, it's very similar to a later compositional style that became popular called fugue where you have essentially a theme that's repeated. But the what I wanted to take away from this, we're not going to go into fugues too much because that's a whole other subject and it's so <laughs> very 
complex thing. But what I want you to take away is lots of moving lines at the same time. And that's uh, kind of the defining characteristic of polyphonic music is that you have lots of different lines moving at the same time. We sometimes refer to this as horizontal music. Why would you call them horizontal, you think? Um, um, kind of each part has a like a separate kind of music type, like a melody. Yeah, but more specifically, uh, we would call it horizontal music because if you look at it on the page, it's like a line going that direction, a line going that direction. And that's kind of the, the interesting part. And may, if this doesn't make sense, it will in a minute because we'll look at vertical music and I'll explain the difference. So let's just uh, say, um, like, uh, let's say um, So let's listen to an example of what I would call vertical music. This is also Renaissance music. So here we go. This one's by Thomas uh, Thomas Tallis. Oh, let's start. Let's start at the start. <laughs> yeah. So if I say, now this music isn't entirely vertical, but why would I say that this music has more like a vertical quality? Um, maybe because of the changes in the chords. Yeah, say. yeah, and the, the idea is that there's chords, chord, chord, with all the parts singing kind of the same rhythm. So we would say this is more of a uh, more monophonic, uh, rather than polyphonic. And this is what gets interesting um, in a minute. Uh, you have essentially, instead of there being a line in the sopranos, a line in the altos, a line in the tenors, you now have soprano alto tenor sings a chord, soprano alto tenor sings a chord, soprano alto tenor sing a chord together with the same rhythm. Uh, so this is why we could call this vertical. And this just has to do with how it looks on the music when you look at it. You'll be like, this is the chord, this is the chord. Um, and indeed, a lot of the way we look at harmony today is much more vertical. When we, you know, when you read a lead sheet of music, you'll see like a chord symbol, which instructs you to play vertically that chord, like so, instead of you playing, you know, you'll be playing something like that. If that's a very cruel example, but yeah, <laughs> um, mm, chord, chord, chord. Let's just uh, put it that way, in all parts together. Okay, so now when we get to chorales, they principally exist in the second category. The key word is mono, uh, chorales tend to be monophonic. Let me just have a quick look at my notes. And but naturally, this isn't like a boom change. Like, ooh, from on this day, all music was polyphonic. Next day, boom, all music was monophonic. Of course, this was a very gradual thing. You see a lot of overlap. So a lot of the Renaissance composers were writing in both styles, and a lot of Baroque composers were writing in both styles. And then kind of towards the end of the Baroque, so you know, towards the days of Mozart, um, the, the polyphonic style kind of fell out of fashion and music became a lot more vertical, chord, chord, chord. Um, yeah, it's a very smooth transition. But chorales, generally speaking, tend to be monophonic. They do still have some uh, elements of polyphony, which we'll talk about, because um, th because this was still a big deal in music, they didn't just abandon it, so they had some things, which we'll look at. And um, cool. Now, 
why uh where was this music heard you think what would be a, a typical stage for them to put this music on back in the day you're not sure no, it's fine <laughs> it's fine so chorales were generally done for uh church services so they would be setting you know they would be setting some sacred text to music and they would tend to use well-known tunes so a lot of chorales aren't actually original compositions they are harmonizations of existing tunes but essentially they've taken it and put harmony in it and this was useful because if you had a church setting and you had a congregation that already knew the lyrics to whatever setting you were doing whatever hymn you were doing then they could still sing the melody and they would also have harmony happening at the same time but you would still hear the melody very clearly um, we'll uh, we'll look at how they did this in a minute, but essentially it was very useful, useful for congregational singing, as the melody was clearly heard, and the harmonies happened underneath it, and I will say underneath in quotation marks because up and down is not really accurate terms for music. Okay, so. Now, as we established, this is music that was really popular a long time ago. We're talking music that was really popular for five, four, three hundred years ago. So it's it's not obvious why this is still useful. But why would we still want to use chorale harmonizations? Can you make some suggestions on why that might be? Mm. Not sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, not exactly sure. No, no. It's. I mean, it's not obvious. There was one thing that was happening in music, which kind of happened right alongside choral harmonizations becoming popular, which was the invention of functional harmony. And again, this was happening during the Renaissance, but it really became a thing during the Baroque. And what exactly is Renaissance? Uh, sorry, what exactly is functional harmony? Um, kind of uh, basing all the chords based on the tonic. Yeah, yeah. So you have uh, the idea that you have a uh, rest chord, which is the tonic, and that the other chords create and release tension based on it. So what's the uh, name of another important chord in functional harmony? Dominance and yeah, absolutely. The tonic and the dominant are probably the most important one. Chords are the dominant, the fifth step. And do you know another one? Subdominant. Subdominant and the subdominant. And you've kind of you've named the you've named the most important ones. The the dominant and the subdominant are kind of the most important. Important is not fair <laughs> qualifier exactly, but they are what became very commonly used. And the sub dominant now sub in case people don't know it's just under the dominant so that's all it means um the fourth step okay so choral harmonization was very useful for for functional harmony because you had chord 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 and then you could really Oh, sorry, you could really delve into the harmony and make that crystal clear. And because functional harmony hadn't been really been a thing before the Renaissance, that was new and exciting. That was quite like forward thinking. Now we hear it and it's like the most cliche. You, you hear a piece of music that's like... And it's like the most cliche thing you've ever heard. But back in the Renaissance, that was like... Like, wow, what's all, all this harmony happening? It's so exciting. But... Has this changed much? I mean, as has our understanding of harmony changed massively since the Renaissance, uh, since the Baroque? Maybe after the, like, the popularization of jazz. Well, you say that, but jazz, 
especially the early jazz music, all uses functional harmony. It's all based on the pro- on the concept of of uh, dominant to tonic. Uh, they had like so they added some some further steps to it. They they had this thing called a two five one where you had a chord before the dominant, but it's still broadly speaking functional harmony. Now of course later on you had more you know free uh, jazz and you had modal jazz which didn't use harmony as strictly as functional harmony. But if you're just listening to music on the radio now, would you say that functional harmony is still being used? Huh? Yeah. Yes, no? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> sorry, you shook your head. So I was like, oh, did I hear that wrong? Um, yeah, no, it's it's absolutely still being used. I mean, you do have loads of different approaches now, but our functional harmony is still very much in use. Now, uh, we've had some developments for sure. We now have, we can now tolerate a lot more tension notes. You could have, a, you could have a seventh, you could have a ninth added to the chords and that doesn't sound wrong or like it has to resolve to our ears. But broadly speaking, that is more or less just an extension of existing functional harmony. So it's still something that's quite useful for music. Also, uh, there's another kind of more, more obvious reason why we want to still use chorale harmonization. What might that be? If some mm-hmm. something sticks around in our society, you know, we 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 wear shoes because they serve a purpose. We you know we use knives to cut our food because it has a purpose. What about choral harmonization? Why would it still? Tradition. Pardon. Tradition. Well, tradition is certainly important. Uh, of functional harmony and choral harmonization means that it sounds correct to our ears and that's just because we're used to it that's you know it could might as well not uh sound correct i mean so jitin you you come from india and uh yeah. in indian classical music you probably wouldn't be using functional harmony in the same way mm-hmm. Not exactly. Not exactly. No, and but that's that's what's tradition there, and that's what sounds correct there. So it's important to remember with anything. Oh, there's a fly in here. Uh, with anything within music, a lot of the reason why we do certain things is because it's been done that way. It's been done that way for ages and ages, and so our ears are used to it. But you could say, just broadly speaking, chorales sound good to our ears. So people still do them it's very it's a very kind of banal reason but the, the you know the fact is that people enjoy the sound of chorale harmonization and that could be you know literally the way it's used in choral music or it could be used you know the way people write and this is quite common in pop music you have maybe a pad of of like strings or synths and very often that's just chord 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 um and is actually not too different from chorale harmonization. So you still have a lot of practical uses for using chorales. Okay. Now, as I said, chorales tend to be monophonic. So let's just uh, list some features of chorales, just so that we have this on the clear. We know exactly what we need to do because we're going to be doing a chorale in a minute. We're just going to make sure that we have, <laughs> we've covered all the important uh, features. So. One important feature is that they tend to be monophonic. Not, uh, you know, not strictly so, but usually that's what it is. They tend to use half functional harmony. That's what gives them their sound. Usually, the harmony is triadic. What do I mean when I say triadic? Uh, based on the triad. Yeah, exactly. Like so, three notes. Yeah, exactly. So it's chords that have three notes to them. So that will be major, minor, uh, suspended. Those are kind of the main ones. You can also have augmented and diminished. Though the 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 the, the, the latter two are kind of less common it's the the first three are most important and then uh, we'll talk about you know extended harmony in a minute uh, which part tends to have the melody in chorales yeah the topmost part 
tense to have the melody. It doesn't always have to be like that. So if you've, and you've followed my material before, so you'll know that you can basically put the melody in any part as long as it's a strong part of their range and that should be fine. So it's not uh, required that you have the melody in the topmost part, but that is very frequently done. So we would often put it in the, the soprano part. In, for instance, in gospel music, the alto part tends to have a melody with the soprano harmonizing above. So it's, this isn't always the case. Uh, yeah. Now, a feature that um, that chorals take f uh, take chorals take from uh, from polyphonic music is that there needs to be good voice leading throughout. Now, I'd say that that would apply to any choral music you do, really. You should always be very careful to make sure you have good voice leading. But because this is an extension of polyphonic music and they were all about line, 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 it goes, you know, it goes without saying that you need to still be observing line, line, line. Um, if you're doing very strict harmonization based on like the, 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 the rules of counterpoint, which were big during the, the, the Renaissance, then there'll be certain kind of guidelines you need to follow when it comes to how the, the parts sound against each other. We're not going to worry too much about that. I'll mention them uh, as we get into it, but it's um, it's become less important now that music has, you know, for hundreds of years been more vertical. Uh, our ears are kind of more accepting of certain uh, stylistic features that would be considered bad writing in the, <laughs> in, the in the Baroque. Um, yeah, I'll mention them, and it's good to you know to be aware of them because the one of the the, the great um, ambitions of musicians back in the Baroque was that uh, Baroque musicians favored smooth lines where all the parts were more or less equal. And in fact, this, this applies to Renaissance um, musicians as well. So what do I mean when I say that all the parts were more or less equal? Do you have a suggestion? <laughs> it's not obvious. <laughs> it's not obvious. Um, Okay, so what I mean is that uh, you can, at any point in the music, decide I'm going to listen to the alto part now. And you should, in theory, be able to hear it clearly, whether it be part of a chord or it's doing its own thing. They'll, uh, they kind of strive to avoid any of the parts becoming covered by the other parts. And this is, more of, this is a very abstract way of seeing it. But this is why, for instance, they would discourage you from writing music where parts are singing in octaves, because it means that they kind of disappear in each other, if you see what I mean. It's not, uh, it's not um, the most obvious thing. Uh, but um, if you're looking at, you know, old compositional rules for uh, chorales, they're done with this in mind, where they want to avoid one part disappearing into another part and stuff like that. Um, and they want it all to sound smooth where no part is drawing more attention than the other. It's very, you know, it's very <laughs> flowery language. But this is kind of where, what they were looking for. And you do find still when you listen to, you know, any kind of choir or string music where people are singing or playing in, in harmony is that they try to achieve it where it sounds like a unit rather than, you know, four different parts playing their own little thing. <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a, um, more of a sub note. It's not massively important for what we do, but it's worth mentioning. Cool. And then there's the last thing which we'll be looking at, which is inversions. Inventions, that's what I want to write. Inversions. There we go. Were common. And what's an inversion? It's kind of basically the uh, bass will be singing a different note in the triad. Yeah. Other than the tonic. Yeah, or yeah, or the root. As a, so uh, when we talk about the chord, we'll talk about the root, the third, the fifth, and maybe the seventh, um, where the bass was 
playing or singing a note that in the chord that isn't that wasn't <laughs> the root so could the bass sing a note that's not in the chord uh, it won't be in like, uh, we can, but uh, well, it won't be in the chord. Yeah, so of course they can. You know, of course you, you, can, you can do anything you want in music. But <laughs> if the bass is playing or singing a note that isn't in the chord, this is called a slash chord. Yeah. And that's something that's more common in uh, pop music so we're not going to worry too much about pop, uh, pop music but essentially it's a way of um having a chord that kind of serves a different purpose than uh the purpose it would normally have in in you know in traditional functional harmony we're not going to worry too much about slash chords because it's a whole other subject but essentially yes you can have them do a different note but then that becomes a different concept altogether so let's not worry too much about it Okay, so I thought we would use a melody that, uh, and again, I wasn't sure how many people were going to join me today, but I thought the, we would use a song that a lot of people would be familiar with for our choral harmonization. And so uh, and I'm not sure if this is big in India Jitten, but are you familiar with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? Named what did you it, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it is a very common, uh, so it's a very popular song, and for good reason. Uh, so I thought we would use that for our choral harmonization because it's a very it's a very approachable uh, piece. It only uses notes that it, are in the key, and could very kind of easily be harmonized using choral harmonization. Okay, so I've got it set up here. I've got my soprano, alto, tenor, bass parts. So we're going to do it in four parts. Normally. Choral harmonization is done in four parts. Does it have to be? Not necessarily. It can be three parts also. Yeah, it can be any number of parts. It's, uh, you know, uh, the number of parts doesn't really have anything to say. But because four parts is a very kind of flexible setup, we will assume that we're going to be writing for four parts. And it's a very common way of doing it. And we'll assume that we'll be writing it just using kind of... Um, baroque harmony so we're not going to be delving into extensions and that kind of stuff we're going to try and make this sound like it was a congregational chorale you know back in the day of Bach um, and again just as an intellectual exercise in actual fact when you're doing chorale harmonization today you wouldn't be just making it using you know the chorale style because uh, the, sorry the, the baroque style because it ends up sounding old-fashioned but just as an intellectual exercise we will use uh that approach because it's really it's really useful right so the way i tend to approach harmonizing in a chorale style is i will choose several points where i'll have a chord that i aim towards and i call this working backwards so i'm just gonna write in uh, and your freude with uh, quotation marks please and your freude from I will say I, I really I really like Beethoven's Nice Symphony. It's a great piece to listen to, but I've sung it a few times uh, as a choral singer, and it's not a particularly fun piece to sing because it's very intense and high, and the voice leading is a bit like. Ugh. But um, but I mean, if you listen to it in the audience, it sounds amazing. So <laughs> okay, this is the one we're going to be using. So. As I said, the technique that I tend to use when I'm doing it is I tend to working backwards um, is useful. Why would it be useful to choose uh, where you're going and then work backwards, you think? Um, it'll be good for the voice leading, 
well, not just the voice leading, but literally just what chords am I going to use? Because uh, it's kind of easy if you know where you're going to and you know that you're going to want to approach it using, you know, maybe the circle of fifths or some sort of, you know, yeah. c combination of chords. It will be easier for you to be like, OK, well, here I'm heading towards the tonic, which means I'm uh, it'll be, you know, good for me to find a spot nearby where I can put in the dominant. And then before the dominant, I maybe want to approach it this way in the bass or stuff like that. So I find I will look at the piece and I'll decide, right, what are kind of the, the, the chords I'm aiming towards. And what's great about uh, Andy Freude is that it has some very obvious points we can aim towards. We just go to the end of the phrase. There, there's our first uh, phrase. And again, this is just looking at the, the, the text and being like, this is a long note where we could stop. In fact, often in chorales, you find literal stops on top of them like this um though uh i wouldn't you know that's not the that's not uh in beethoven's <laughs> version but sometimes they do this to just like mark like this is the end of the phrase um then it's uh i'll get to the panorama mode up actually so we can see it all anyway here's the second stop again just mark it up. This is the, our second goalpost. And then here, this is a funny thing in the original, where it has a huge uh, syncopated uh, phrase uh, going into the next one. So this would kind of be the end of the phrase, but we are aware that this is going straight into the next chord. But kind of, it, it is still kind of the end of the phrase. And alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dann sagt der Flügelwelt. And then this is the end note. Now, with functional harmony, it normally tends to be in major or minor, which means that at the end of the piece, what's a very likely last chord we'll be going to? F. F, yeah. In this case, F would be the tonics. So, and I'll, I very often do this. I just write out the chords I want. So I'll be like, okay, well, this is going, probably going to be ending up at F. What would be a good chord to approach F with? C. C, yeah, the dominant. And what's great here is that before this F, we got a G, and is G a note that we find in the chord of C? Absolutely, it is. So, oops, I'll just write in C here. And then, so then I've already decided that I'm gonna be having something that goes up. Something like that. Uh, sorry be. to interrupt the flow, just uh, can you make sure the piano I can't hear the piano sound. You can't hear the... You can't hear that. Uh, hang on. It should be coming up in the stream. Okay, so I probably... Yeah, this is a technical problems, of course. Uh, let's go into the um, uh, thing here. Let's see. Audio engine. Mm, well, it says multi output device. Okay. Um, how do I do this? Oh, uh, I know what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly change this to be Scarlet. I'll send it through my microphone instead. Actually, I don't think I actually have to do this. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean for this to be... Knut has to troubleshoot yet another thing. Um, let me just check if I've actually shared my sound first of all. Uh, yeah, it should be showing the sound, so that's weird. And um, still can't hear it. E okay, here's what we'll do. I will switch this to go through my microphone, which means I'll have to restart this. Or do I? Can you can you hear that? I can't hear that either. Damn. Um, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll just give you the computer sound, uh, sorry, the piano sound like this. Uh, can you hear that? Yeah, good. All right, so now Jitin is getting the, um, uh, the, 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 the keyboard sound, uh, but I will, for the sake of the stream, I'll just turn this back to the choral sound. So I don't know why this isn't, uh, where, this, uh, where this changed because I haven't really changed my settings, but anyway, my uh, YouTube viewers will still get the choral sound. I'll just play through everything 
uh, so that you can hear it. Okay. So we know that, okay, here we are going to C. Now I see uh, here, so this is the phrase. Now uh, here we will encounter our first use of inversions, I reckon. Because, and I'll bring up, I made a little, uh, little um, PDF for this, functional inversions. Because with inversions, I wouldn't want to use them haphazardly. I'd want to use them with a very, uh, with a very kind of clear aim. So let me just make this uh, look good and clear on the stream. How do I get rid of the sidebar? Just slightly smaller. And down here. There we go. Okay, so if you have a root position chord, we would generally consider that a stable chord. Now, it, that's what I mean by that is that's not a chord that would in and of itself lead anywhere. But of course, in the key of F, C would be the dominant. So you would in context feel like this is going towards F. But if it's just a C on its own, just that doesn't feel like it needs to go anywhere. If you do a first inversion, the second one, there is an implied pull towards the note above the bass note. It kind of pulls towards it. You see what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. This, um, and I kind of try to write down what pull they tend to have. Now, this isn't always the case. So with uh, the first inversion, it does tend to pull down, but in, you know, in context, it could, you know, just as well be. Could just as well be going downwards. But usually first inversions are done going up. Second inversions, where you have the fifth in the bass, doesn't normally lead anywhere. But it's stick to the same. Pardon? Well, stick to the same base note, right? Eight inch six four. Yeah. So, it's um, what tends to happen with second versions is that it tends to set up a dominant very commonly. So you have this kind of effect. That's a very common use of a, of a second inversion. So doesn't have to. It could also be part of a phrase. For instance, uh, I quite like this one. <laughs> Which also uses a second inversion going up. But doesn't have to. Going down, it would be... That would also be a second inversion going down. Uh, so it doesn't really have a preferred direction it wants to go to. But it's as I said, it's very often done as a means of setting up a dominant. And the reason why I say this is because in our music here, we have a very good opportunity to test this out. This F here, we know that we're getting towards the end of the piece. We know that we're getting towards the big resolution of dominant to tonic. So here we have a phrase that, that kind of fits on the tonic, kind of, but to make it more interesting and to set up our dominant that's coming up, we could make this a second inversion. So it would be F over C, uh, which would work fine on F, F and A, but we, so typically in choral harmonization, whenever the melody is staying on the same note, you tend to stay on the same chord, but when it moves, you tend to change chord. Uh, that's why a lot of chorales can sound very like going this direction, this direction, this direction, because they're always changing chord. So typically you would, if you get to this G, you would then change chord. Now, because we're already on C in the bass and G is part of the C chord, we could just have it as C, like so. And then another F over C here. See what I mean? So that what we would get, and again, this is just from me knowing that I'm heading towards the F here at the end. And I know that towards the end of the piece, you want to set up a big, nice dominant. Um, so we, we get this phrase. Uh, okay, and this is uh, not, you know, I haven't decided on the voice leading stuff yet, but it'll be something like something like that. That's a very typical um, functional harmony kind of line. Does this make sense? 
Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. I am going to... Yeah, that's fine. So that's what I mean. I've, I know where I'm going to. Now I have to can go a bit further back. Um, um, so I know that I'm going towards. So then I will think, okay, well, I want the bass to end up on this note. How do I get it there? And a very... Um, and I'm going to do one thing here because I realize that I'm probably sending up both sounds in my uh, thing. I'm just going to turn, turn this audio engine off. Uh, how do I? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I'm just doing this because I realize that I'm actually uh, uh, probably sending two sounds to my uh, sound card right now which isn't great. I'm going to just uh, restart my Sibelius. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, it's rating and I'll do for you. With a lot of choral harmonization, you're thinking about where the melody is going and how's the bass moving against it. And you want to, you know, create kind of a line out of the bass that works with the harmony that you're making. And this, this is something that becomes easier with practice. So, when we have this phrase that comes before, I know here, can you still hear the piano by the way? Um, yeah, cool. I'm just gonna switch my, uh, my uh, sound to the keyboard so I can actually hear <laughs> um, the keyboard myself. Let's give it a go. Cool. And I'm going to just send the audio from my account. I'm terribly sorry about this guy, uh, guys. Uh, like so. Okay. So I know that I'm. Uh, sorry. Why am I not hearing it? Uh, oh, yeah. There we go. So I know that my bass is now on the C here. Working backwards, I'll know that I'll want the, that, that bass to approach the C somehow. I could approach it from above or below. Now, in chorale harmonization, uh, a very popular uh, device is called contrary motion. Are you familiar with contrary motion? What is that? What exactly is contrary motion? Sorry, could you re could you repeat what you said? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, contrary motion is common in corals. That is whichever direction the melody moves, the bass moves in the opposite direction. Now, for some reason, this just sounds good to our ears. So you can assume that if you can put some contrary motion into your harmonization, it's gonna sound good, which is why I know here, we've got this phrase happening. We've got this melody descending here, which means that if I can have the, the, uh, the bass approaching in the other direction, so something like that, where I have, where it's literally contrary motion, that would sound good. Do you see what I mean? So I'll know here that if I can, for instance, on this C here, I'll decide that here, I'll have the bass on the F and I'll have it go in contrary motion. Then suddenly both parts are where they need to be. And then I'll be like, okay, how do I create chords that sound like they lead here? So I'll be, okay, well, uh, the first one's easy because my bass will be on the F and my melody will be on the C, which means that that's a very natural place to put just the C chord. Second one, here is where I, so you have the bass on the G and the, the melody on the B flat, but I know that I'm also going towards the A, which is a natural point to put um, um, the tonic. Pardon? 
So, yeah, first inversion tonic. Now, I'll, this will, won't be what we do, and I'll tell you why in a minute, but if I were to harmonize this, I'll be like, well, I'm going towards another kind of F chord, which means that I can then proceed it with what kind of chord? So I know that I'm heading to some sort of F chord here. What would be a chord I could put before the F chord? Maybe a C, yeah, exactly. Now my soprano is on B flat, which isn't technically in the C chord, but it is the dominant seventh or the flat seventh, which is uh, an allowable extension in chorale harmonization. Now, I mean, technically speaking, you could put in as many extensions as you want, but I know that if I do something like this, where I have a C chord with a G, um, something like that. So I'll play that again. Uh, Sorry, I gotta get all the notes in there. <laughs> um, how do I do it? So about that. That is using an inversion to achieve that movement in the bass while also accommodating for this at the top. So the harmony you end up with is F and then C7 over G. So again, this is a first inversion uh, no, sorry, a second inversion of the F. So it doesn't necessarily move, lead in a direction, but in this case, it leads up and then we'll assume maybe F over A and then the next one, I'll, again, I'll know that I'll want to have my um, uh, bass on the B flat and my melody on the G. Okay, well, what chord in the key of F has those features? Do you know? Not sure? You're not sure. Okay, so <laughs> it's fine. It's um, I mean, um, if you don't have a piano in front of you, maybe it's hard to think about it. Essentially, so I've got this phrase. So I've got a situation where I need to find a chord that has B flat in the bass, but also a G. But it needs to be in the key of F. You're not sure? Yeah, you could use a minor. And what kind of minor chord would it be? G minor. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, I know that, okay, so I'm not sure what chord I want to use. Let's use another chord in the key that uses the, the, these two notes, that uses a G and a, a, um, a B flat. Okay, well, there's two options. I could use a diminished chord, which kind of sounds okay, but I could also use a G minor, like so. And from our jazz theory, Again, this is uh, kind of taking it a bit kind of ahead in time, but this was also commonly done in the Baroque. If you've got a dominant, you can precede it with the dominant of that dominant. We call it a secondary dominant. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, what would be the dominant of C? G, exactly. Now, if we're keeping it just in the key, we would be using a G minor. That would just be using the one that's in the key, like so. In this case, we end up with this progression. And then we have our... Now, the question is, could we make this, um, this G here a G major? Instead of a G minor? Yeah, you absolutely can. So, as long as the melody is covered, I mean, we, we can do literally anything with the other parts. So because we know that now it's not going to a C, but it's kind of it's uh, it's kind of going to a C that is like um, just uh, waiting to get there, if you see what I mean. I mean I'm kind of using the fire in language, but you know that that's what you're expecting. But then you get this uh, before that. So you could just make this a major G with... Um, with a B in the bass. And in that case, you end up with this kind of phrase. That, that kind of feels maybe a little strong, but it will work. Now, one concern I have here is that I decided to have a first inversion here. Now, for anyone who knows um, about Baroque harmony, what's a potential problem with this? That I decided to have a first inversion. And again, this is the thing that we wouldn't really consider a big problem these days, but back in the Baroque, 
uh, there was an idea that you shouldn't be doubling certain notes in the chord. Do you see what I mean? It's fine. You usually don't double the major third in a major chord. But uh, this isn't something that's as important now. Now, if you're being very kind of, if you're being very proper about it, then you wouldn't be doing that. But we're going to not worry too much about it. So in this case, I'm just going to write out something that will will work. So it'll be uh, maybe... Da, 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 da. Uh, no, that's not going to work. Now, here comes the problem of voice leading, where you have to um, invent something that will you know, work with all the stuff you need. Um, I'll probably want to drop down the space, but yeah. And then you have something like, uh, like that. And again, this just comes from uh, the thing that I do usually is I, I will look at the top note and then I'll fill in. Now with choral harmonization, you also have to take the bass into account because you will have developed a bass line that has some sort of movement to it. So in this case, I'll want that bass line to be down an octave, so I'm just get that down the octave like so. Uh, let's use it that. So about that. That's just a really nice and singable bass line. Cool. So you end up with I don't know. Let me see if I can just read this with what I just wrote. And again, this was just filling in the chords. Does this sound like a chorale to you? Yeah, and I'll just, uh, just do this properly. There we go. Okay, yeah, I mean, and, th and that's a nice phrase to end on. Now we need to get to that F somehow. We, ha we haven't kind of finished here. Uh, but let's not worry about that. Let's leave this for now and go here. We, we have this phrase um, going out. Uh, That's the previous phrase. Now, when you get to that C, what's a very natural chord to have on that C, you think? Yeah, exactly. That's a very common. And what's great here is because the next phrase starts on, the, on this A, which is, uh, which if we decide to go with a C here, what really cool chord to get to on the, on the A here. Pardon? Yeah, the tonic. The tonic, exactly. Exactly. You get you get that resolution, and again, this is very common in rock harmony. So let's just assume we're going to F here, and then we can uh, finish off our phrase because we've decided right. But we are definitely getting to C here and then F here, which means that we're starting on something like this chord. Um, uh, and then you can start to be creative with your inversions. For instance, I'm thinking. Should I? Ah, let's not. There's all sorts of ways you can harmonize this in more clever ways. You could have, um, you know, uh, some kind of inversion happening here. But okay, so we know that we're in some sort of F chord and we're heading towards just the normal F chord here. Okay, well, let's work backwards. Okay, so we've got. Something like that. Okay, so. Something like that, maybe. So here we can just use a very simple cadence because we're an F and we're trying to get to F. Okay, well, we don't have to, you know, make it bombastic and big. We can just decide, okay, well, we'll probably stay on the same chord here because it's the same note. Now, the second one, we can go to the two chord. So just move everything up. Uh, maybe that's not the strongest. Let's go to the four. So typically in, you know, in classical music, you'd go, you'd go to the four, um, the four chord, or you would use a second, a first invention, second, uh, second chord. So it'd be. Uh, so like that, or with a first inversion, two chord. There's very minor differences between the two. So let's just say, on this B flat, we'll go to the four chord, the subdominant, B flat, and then C. As long as you can stay on a tonic or a subdominant or a dominant, it's probably going to sound quite strong. And then we just fill that in very, very simply. Uh, now I'm writing the bass part. Uh, I would normally write the bass part all the way on F, but 
just for the purposes of having a strong bass, we'll just do it. That will, you know, that will sound quite strong. So in this case, we have. A, uh, no, that's not correct. Etc. Does that sound strong to you? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's not terribly interesting, but as an intellectual exercise, it works great. Okay, and then we will just do the same with the preceding phrase. We'll be like, okay, well, we're aiming for F. Good. Okay, so what's a, what's a natural chord that could lead to C? Thinking back to our circle of fifths. <laughs> the two chord, yeah, exactly. Like so, yeah, so that's G minor. So we end up with a two five one essentially. Uh, two five one, very good. So in this case, that would be G minor and then C, and then uh, we can think, okay, but we'll probably again want to have some sort of nice approaching, approaching from below. So maybe having uh, first inversion, G, something like that, and then. We can have that approaching, so if we think about F, that could be a first inversion tonic, going up to the full second, uh, the first inversion, so first inversion going to a first inversion going to the dominant. See what I mean? And this is all I'm doing now, is I'm picking important chords in the key, so in this case it's just a tonic, and then I'll write, I'll be thinking, okay, well, I want to approach, I'm approaching that C. Okay, well, a good approach tone is, is just the, four, the fourth step. Okay, well, I can do that, and then I can have the two chord, and then I can approach from below that even. And that automatically sounds quite uh, like quite a strong chorale harmonization kind of thing. Okay, and then I keep going back. Okay, so I know that I have this line coming up in the bass. Okay, well, I'll look here and I'll be like, okay, well, that G, I could, there's two ways I could do it. I could have the bass on G as well. Um, so that'll be, uh, again, you get this really strong rising phrase in the bass. Or I could have it go down. And again, I wouldn't, you know, consider those massively different, but... In fact, you're just putting in another G minor chord here, and it'll be either you know going from G or, or from B flat. It's kind of it'll be depending on what I choose to do before that. Uh, so the phrase is that's the phrase. Now that sounds um, like a very kind of again this just comes from experience. That sounds like a very dominant Teutonic kind of phrase. You see what I mean? And that just comes from me having listened to loads of classical music. I know that that kind of phrase very often is a tonic, a dominant resolving to a tonic. So let's put that in. I'll be okay. Well, this is most likely. Uh, now I actually went back here, and I'm like, okay. Well, that is most likely going to be some sort of C chord, with whatever inversion we need here. Maybe we'll use our second inversion F again because that's the A is in in the F chord, and then this will be C7, because we have a B flat, which is the seventh, resolving to F. Then we could even, now we're changing chords here, uh, now here we'll have to think, because uh, we're trying to, again, change chords whenever we, pardon? We can go back to C, uh, uh, so let me just get this. Maybe there. Okay, so what I, so now I was just trying out things. I knew that, okay, well here, I'm kind of having the same phrase again, so I don't want to change the harmony massively. I'll still want to come to some sort of C with uh, F over, with a second inversion uh, tonic leading nicely to a dominant and then back to F here. Okay, well, before that, I can literally just change this to a first inversion 
tonic. So because then I get this nice thing in the bass. Which just becomes a very smooth and singable line. Down the octave, of course, because I'm not really a bass singer. Uh, and then I just fill in. So I'll be like, okay, well, this is a C. And then, okay, first inversion. Again, just this is basically just setting up a dominant. And then tonic. And then, again, we're not staying on the same chord, but we're changing to an inversion just because we know that the bass is going to be going up to the C. And then it's the same phrase again. And then the bass is just going up. Uh, now here we could even, and this isn't really um, fantastic for chorales, but you could even have them go into unison. I quite like it when they're, they're all approaching the same note and they're suddenly on the same note. That's just a, a fun arrangement thing that I like. So if I'm assuming that all my parts are approaching that C and then break into harmony for the for the A here. Um, strictly speaking, that's not uh, great chorale harmonization because chorales really shouldn't be in unison. But that's just me thinking, okay, well, that's a, a very natural point to have them go into into unison. Okay, so let me just finish off this phrase. Now, again, I'll then want to look, what did I have before here? Well, I decided the previous phrase where I wanted to have a stop was... Uh, And this kind of phrase, do, 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 what's a very tip, what, what's a very typical harmony for that kind of phrase? Five to one, exactly, yeah, exactly. That's great. You already know all of this, Jason. Just tell, I'm just telling you what you already know, exactly. So you know that this is most likely going to be the tonic. And again, this just comes from having listened to loads of music. You just know that 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 sounds like it should be on the tonic, which means the next phrase. Uh, well, you know, we're kind of free to start where we want, really, on the next phrase. Okay, well, that's also a very kind of dominant to tonic kind of phrase, isn't it? In fact, it's exactly the same thing we had. Didn't we have this somewhere already? Do, 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 do. Yes, almost the same phrase. Do, 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 do. And then do, 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 do. It's almost the same phrase. Okay, well, we'll just use kind of the same kind of harmony. So C, C, F. And then we'll use the first inversion, and then back to C. I think this is exactly what Beethoven did, actually. Again, just filling in, uh, thinking about what does the phrase sound like it wants to do. And again, it comes from just listening loads and being like, okay, well, this is what would normally happen, F. Now, mind you, we are going to be doing more to this in a minute, because we haven't. there's one thing we haven't done. Uh, which I m mentioned briefly, but uh, uh, we can essentially introduce a little bit of motion to these parts who are all singing the same chord uh, in a bit. But I'm just going to spread these out. So remember, I use the, the arrange function. Just write it all in one staff and then spread it out like this. Oh, I did actually. Yeah, you're completely right. <laughs> I don't, what, what is this doing here? Be gone. I don't want you. Don't need you. Okay. Yeah, select all of them like this. Saves so much time. Boom. And I'll keep the, the chord symbols in the soprano, but I'll just remove them from the other parts just because it looks it looks nicer. Chord symbols. Oops, not comments. Chord symbols. There. Boom. Just so that we have them. Now, we will have to go through and look at the voice cleaning, but again, as I mentioned... Um, in one of my earlier videos, if you do top to bottom harmonization where you start the soprano, you've already put the soprano in a good range and you're harmonizing going down, most likely the voice leaning is going to be good. Now, we do have one moment here, like specifically, all the way there, there, and there, which is a very awful jump. So we're not going to... Um, uh, we're going to change this, but let's not worry about it just yet. So what's great about the first two phrases is they're basically the exact same phrase twice. So what's great then is we can literally use the same harmonization twice and it's going to sound correct. 
don't be afraid to to um, to loop material. Repetition is the cornerstone of of kind of Western music. It's just some have longer sections that repeats than others, but basically repetition is the key. Okay, so now the the phrase. If we f consider that we're going from the first phrase, this is our first go. Okay, well that's. We're on a G, we've come from there, 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 and then there's kind of almost an implicit drag down there, which means that what uh, what chord would be a, uh, an appropriate one? Yeah, exactly. This is also a very like dominant kind of moment. So something like, again, we'll use our, probably use our second inversion tonic. Exactly. This, uh, you know, that would be if we then assume that the next phrase would probably go to an F and that this would probably be some sort of second inversion tonic. Yeah, no, second inversion tonic tends to kind of imply, or second inversion anything, tends to imply that there's a there's a dominant coming up uh, on the same notes. Cool, and then we work backwards and we'll be like, okay, well, we have th this, uh, uh, that's what we're aiming for. Okay, so this is the phrase before. Okay, so how would we do this? Um, and because this note loops, we could probably assume that we'll use the same chord for both of these. This is normally done in chorales. So what we're looking at is an approach here. Now on that G, again, if we're assuming that we'll want uh, to approach, maybe have the bass line go up towards the C, like so. Here we have a nice little F. Okay, well, if I decide to have the A in the bass and the F in the melody, we have them in tenths essentially, which is, and arranging stuff, having the melody and the, the bass in tenths tends to sound good. It tends to sound good. It's almost like arranging in thirds. Okay, well, if we assume that we then have that, okay, so. A and F, what kind of chord would we have? First inversion tonic, exactly right. <laughs> I hope this makes sense for someone watching who doesn't know functional harmony because I feel like we're just kind of going through it really quickly. We just, we know the answer already. Yeah, and then we would hear on that G, if the bass is also going up to B flat, what would we record? First inversion of the two, yeah. So we have two, and then some sort of setting up the five. F over C, F over C, and then C. Okay, so we just, um, uh, okay, let's go back. So we're, this is the, this is the phrase. Could we improve this maybe? Maybe just to have something happen now. Let's then let's not worry about it. Um, okay, so the previous phrase is do, 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 do. now we're getting down. We're again this kind of phrase. Do, 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 do. In, what does that invite when the soprano is going da, down, 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 down? What does that invite? That invites what? Well, yeah, I mean it does kind of, but but what kind of motion if the if the soprano is going down 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 what does that imply with the bass yeah well it goes it goes the opposite direction but then it can go down like so again just thinking contrary motion contrary motion makes uh, makes chorales sound good so i can think okay well most likely then i'll want to have uh, this kind of motion um, and then I'll probably want to just have it done on the A. As I said, that'll be fine because that's basically just a semitone down. So we get this motion. That sounds, you know, that sounds kind of correct-ish. And then we just fill in the chords. So we'll be like, okay, well, this is probably just going to be an F. Uh, maybe like so. And then, in fact, we had this very phrase later, didn't we? It's this phrase. Do, 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 do. Okay, well, let's just reuse our harmonization here. So F, uh, you know, F, and then first inversion, no, sorry, second inversion dominant, like so. 
going up to our um, first inversion tonic. And then first inversion two. And then we'll, we'll instead have it go down. So we'll have first inversion tonic, two, and then first inversion, and then second inversion, two, two, two. Again, for anyone watching who feels like this is just zooming by, essentially I've kind of decided I want to have contrary motion here, and I want so what I'm just I'm filling in chords that will lead to each other. So we're basically just using F here and then C7 over G, F over A, G minor over B flat. So instead of just having them root position the whole time, which we could do, we could you could have you know. but it doesn't sound kind of as smooth. And as I mentioned earlier, you want it to sound smooth. Now a very easy way to make it sound smooth is to use inversions. So you have those same chords. So you do use these exact same chords. Um, those were all root position, but by using inversions, we can end up with a much more smooth line in the bass. suddenly it just sounds a bit more like it's going somewhere if you see what I mean cool let's just finish off the very first phrase now what's a very natural chord to start on in any song tonic yeah and that makes for a very natural um, here we can do what we did we have this phrase later on I think where we just have a, a two five one kind of going to that F because we know that we want to have an F here in the bass okay well let's do a uh, four Like so. So then what we end up with is just one or F, one, one, same notes, four, five, one. When it comes to functional harmony, the four and the two can kind of be used a bit interchangeably. They kind of, so they share two notes, G minor, which is the two, and B flat, which is the four, they share two notes. So B flat and D, the notes exist in both those chords, which means that they can kind of do each other's job. You will find this with a lot of harmony. A lot of the chords that share notes can do the same job. Okay, now we're assuming that we're just using the exact same harmonization here. We could, uh, and we will probably have time to mix things up a bit, but I wanted to cover one more topic which is really important when it comes to choral harmonization. So let's just write in exactly the same. What I do then, I mean, I wanna keep the text, so I'm just gonna copy the, the chords here. The only phrase that's changed is the, the last chord. So the C to F. So, It'll be, and I'm just again. I am much, very much a proponent of keep it. If if you can keep it the same, because otherwise your singers will forget and they will start singing wrong things. So here, there's no reason to change it. Uh, just like that. Oops. <laughs> Played it wrong. There we go. Now, I've harmonized it all, but I've neglected to do a few things. Well, first of all, I've neglected to put in dynamics, which, you know, well, yeah, that's true. But what's one common thing you find in classical music that I haven't been using at all here when it comes to the harmony? Any ideas? There's something you can do when you change chords. You don't have to change every single note. Do you know what this is? You're not sure? So what I'm talking about is you can suspend notes. Oops, I wanted to see if... Yeah. You can just suspend a few notes to create more interest in the harmony. And this is also where the concept of the of polyphony comes into cross because right now it's just like the same rhythm in all parts you don't have to do that you can suspend it so what exactly is and well i'll get my culture up with suspensions what are suspensions do you know usually a third does it have to be the third no no, so the, 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 the idea of suspension is that 
one note is held after the others change and then changed later and this helps with um, creating movement and harmonic interest and what's really useful about suspensions is if you're suspending something that maybe clashes quite a lot with the other core with the other notes that creates a lot of like excitement and then it resolves a very common kind of line you might suspend you know would be something like um, uh, you have the top and the, the second top note most parts constantly changing between thirds and seconds and it just sounds really exciting um i'll post uh and just make a note for myself to post there's a very famous classical piece that does this very successfully where the, the soprano and alto are, are, are like always in seconds and it's very very stingy and then it, they change and i'll just uh I'll, I'll make a note to link to it uh, ooh. I forget exactly what it's called, but yeah. Okay, so let's have a look and see if we can suspend any notes here to make it more interesting. What's a very, and you mentioned the most common suspension, which is what? Yeah, the third. Yeah, exactly. You suspend the third, and you do it by having uh, essentially whatever note is around the third or would be serving the role of the third. You just have that um, held. And most typically, it's done by holding the four. And you can see this happen already in the first phrase towards here, Elysium, you can have the altos remain on their F for a while and maybe, and then resolve it a bit later, like so. So I'll just, and then I just have to rewrite, like so. So the effect you end up with, and I'll play it on the piano so you can hear it. Um, he says, Elysium. See what I mean? <laughs> And what this does is it makes the harmony more interesting, but it also creates a bit more motion. And you can do this basically anywhere. Now, while I remember, let's have a look at the voice cleaning here, by the way. That's all fine, that's all fine. This jump is probably not necessary. Let's have, okay, so this is a first inversion, which means this could probably just be on the C here. Um, yeah, let's have it go. I don't want it to have an octaves with the soprano, so I'm just gonna keep it on C. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's fine. I mean, this voice leading is perfectly fine. Good, and then we have the same situation at the end of the next phrase, Heiligtum, uh, where we have a dominant going towards the one. Now here, suspending the third might be, oh, we could do it. So here again, the altos are on the third. Okay, well, they're on the F before, which means we can suspend it, move it up to F. And then down, oops, down to C, and then down to uh, down to E, and then to C. So in this case, it will be. Uh, like so. Again, that just makes the harmony slightly more interesting. And again, it's very, very common in chorales to do this. Um, cool. Now you could do it. Uh, you could do it here. I I would recommend not just blasting into suspensions wherever you can. So you could technically do it on the diamond sabo. Uh, you could do it, but suspensions kind of tend to to work best if you can carry them over from the previous bar. If you see what I mean, we can actually set this up here. So what note can we normally leave out in a major chord? Which is, can we leave out the, the, the one, the three, or the five? Pardon? Yeah, you can leave out five. So what we, <clears throat> what we can do here, we, we, can, we can set up a suspension by putting our altos up on F. And this is going to sound correct. This is not a problem. And then they can then stay on that F. So you do get that effect of these suspensions. So in this case, it'll be... get that effect of the suspension still uh, you can shoot into suspensions but they, it tends to sound a little bit like forced in my opinion anyway so i tend to to suggest that people instead set them up by having the part that you want to stay on the notes just be on that note already uh, da, 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 da. 
and then you can do it again again because here um, we're repeating the phrase so you could and now you're shooting into it but you've already done it once so it's fine so then the effect is this becomes sus4 and then c and i'll just uh i should really put this in everywhere just so it's completely clear like so again i'll i'll post this music for anyone who's watching and is interested in in uh, what's happened here i'll just write it in like this cool all right uh, now we don't have to do it. I mean, I, I will want to suggest that you do it on, on the dominance because that is so commonly done that people almost like expect it. Again here, it's exactly same, exactly the same suspension happening. So it's for C and then F, and then we have. Cool. There's another note we could add to our dominance which we haven't. What would that be? So for most of these chords, they're triads, but there's one note we can add, especially on dominance. What would that be? Yeah, the seventh, exactly. A lot of the time, even in classical music, you would have the seventh on your dominance. So now here comes the trick, because you kind of want to avoid uh, moving um, the, the suspended note at the same time as the whatever you suspend to get to the seventh. So let's look at this first phrase. Elysium. What you don't want, because here very it would make a lot of sense to have the tennis go down to a B flat, because that's the the seventh of the chord. So it'll be something like, uh, and then you get this really strong, uh, strong, dominant, because of the this uh, flat. What you don't want when you have a suspension is to do, um, because you kind of it's a bit of a missed opportunity. It, um, it's more effective to have the um, uh, have them move at different times. So in this case, I'll want to move my tenors with the sopranos, like so. And in this case, this particular case, it's useful because the sopranos, which are on the on the two, or on the sorry, on the five of the <laughs> of the C, they will be moving in sixths, sixths my least favorite word in the world, sixths, uh, with the tennis, which is a very like pleasant motion. That works really well. So in this case, we get... And then two, the tonic. Um, so that's, another, that's the second thing I would make sure that I add in anywhere I can. Same here with a uh, high league tom here. Tenors again, very natural to move them down to say a B flat like so. Now here, I'd probably want to move them down on the first beat instead of the second, again to avoid this thing where I'm moving them at the same time as the altos. This is more like a personal preference, but very typically the suspended fourth and the seventh will be in fifths. Which can sound, especially if you're talking about Baroque music, it's kind of okay, but um, it can sound a little bit like stark to have them move at the same time. So it's just a little bit nicer, in my opinion. Um, it's not massively bad, but like in this case, you end up with. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Which just sounds a little bit smoother. And here, uh, I think this doesn't really merit well you could so in this case we'd have the tenors on there again looking at the altos or doing the suspended note okay well we'll have them on b flat on one because the sopranos are uh, the the altos are resolving on two and uh same here um bin, dun. okay okay so in this case we want to make sure that these are long notes because only the sopranos and altos are moving Again, this is more of a notational thing, but I just like slur these together, make sure that anyone. And this can stay on. Again, this is the voice leading thing. It can stay on that C because we have F. Yeah. Okay. Um, this could be suspended. 
like so. Again, I'm just moving stuff. Now you're kind of, I'm getting to the point where I'm just like, well, I can move this here, I can move this here. And uh, essentially, I'm just kind of improving things very slightly. I will put this up on uh, in a drive so people can have a look here as well. I'm, you know, there's a suspended note coming up. I could, by keeping my tenors on that C there so they don't have to jump down, that means I can put my as my alt is on that F, which means my suspension here, I'll write in that this is suspension, will sound a bit more smooth because I already have that F in the chord. Again, these are like minor things, but yeah, I prefer when you set up suspensions to have them already kind of there uh, in the previous bar. Okay, let's deal with this thing, because here, um, the this massive jump in the basis is not gonna work. So <laughs> let's put them up an octave, like so. That's fine, that's more manageable. And yeah, this, this should sound very good. Cool, uh, do we have any more potential for, yeah, so the last one here. Here, let's stick our seventh in like this. There, okay. So now we added in sevenths to our dominance. Okay, what other chords can we put suspensions to? Let's have a look. Um, typically on major chords, you can add in the second. That would be a nice, note to suspend and then resolve down to the one. So we could technically put maybe this alto line up on the G. So then you'd get this phrase. Uh, uh, yeah. That kind of phrase. That would sound fine. That's another type of suspension where you're kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very mild suspension, but it's uh, one that I, that, that, that can sound especially quite good in pop music. Um, I'm not, yeah, okay, that goes up to F, that's fine. I would want to put in dynamics normally. I'm just going to assume that this is like a congregational hymn and that they're all singing it super loud, so we'll just be like, dynamic is F the whole time. Like so. Cool, what other... Probably wouldn't want to put any extensions on these. Um, no, that's fine. Don't think we need any extensions on these. You could, on the two chord, you put could put in the seventh. That would be fine. So that would be, for instance, in this phrase, if I were to change the altos, the phrase would be... Uh, there, with that seventh. That's also a, an allowable kind of thing to do. So on the on the two chords, you could put in a seventh. Let's, for the sake of, of um, having it as educational as possible, we'll stick in a seventh. So G minus seven, like so. And again, this is what they do in jazz music. You have a minor seventh, then a dominant, and then the tonic. Yeah. This is also, these are also sevenths. So I just write this in so that's crystal clear. Okay. Add in our, so this is called an add nine. Could You could call it add two, but normally you call it on the, the interval they are beyond, um, beyond the octave. Again, this is just stuff that's going to, it's going to sound very correct, if you will. It's going to sound like this, this uh, sounds correct. Um, good, no need to put, we could, no, there isn't, and here I could technically put in maybe a second, but there isn't really a, a good spot to put it. Um, and it would, sometimes if you go a bit crazy with the, the added notes, it can end up sounding just like a bit forced. So I wouldn't recommend going to crazy but here we have the again this is exactly the same phrase as before so here we have the option of a seventh do do okay f do, 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 do. okay very good this is a seventh i'm sorry i'm just uh, i'm just uh, cleaning up the notation a bit uh <laughs> does this all make sense by the way are you yeah Again, I feel like I'm I'm get, I'm uh, I'm having it quite easy here because I know that you just and you already kind of know this kind of stuff. So what I'm describing probably already makes sense to you. Um, uh, let's just make this. Uh, yeah, that'll be good. In da, da. that's just a straight. No, that this uh, sorry, this is seventh exactly. The yeah yeah here we could put in a ninth. Absolutely. Um, here we can put in the seventh. Again, I'm just putting in notes. With this uh, as four. Now that they're getting a bit cramped, but I'll clean this up for when I 
plats. Uh, no. No, okay, here we gotta be careful because if I were to have both a ninth here and then a seventh here, you would have Sopranos and Altos in in seconds, in consecutive seconds, which can sound a bit naff, so I'm just gonna put it like this. Uh, so it's just a straight F and then G seventh, like so. Trying it tilt, and then you can stay on. No, I, yeah, you can stay on an F, why not? Okay, so that means we have a seventh here as well. Now I'm, I'm basically just putting in all sorts of, ex, you know, extended harmony. This will be just a, a C, you know, there isn't really any harmony there, but it's, uh, if you have everyone on the C, there's like an implied dominant almost, so it's fine. Okay, now this is the first phrase, so we'll have our, so our altos up on their G, same as they started. And uh, there. Now these guys were up on that F before. Again, I'm just making it so that it's the same version of the line every time. Yeah, just because I know that, uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, with the singers, we tend to forget. <laughs> and um, uh, just sing the incorrect line, if you will. Actually, they need to go down there. Da, 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 da. And then here, yeah, we'll have that as a seventh. I think, no, actually, I've changed my mind because we have this line in the altos. Again, this is me looking out for, for potential problems with the, between the altos and the tenors. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So now I've kind of got this all. So I've put in some suspensions of the, the seventh, of the, um, of, of the, sorry, of the fourth, put in some suspended uh, uh, nines here and there, uh, added in a seventh on dominance. Cool. Um, what else can we do here? Well, I mean, this is kind of, this is choral harmonization, basically. Looking at it now, I would probably put it up maybe a tone, just because that F is quite low for the basses, but it's like quite nice to have a nice, like low note. Uh, but then I would also, I guess it's kind of okay. I wouldn't worry about it. Cool. Okay. Right, well, I hope that all made sense. Uh, do you have any questions? No. Okay. What I'm going to do, I'm going to export this audio and put it on the on the YouTube page so that people can have a listen to it and see what it sounds like because I'm having some sort of technical problems with the sound. Um, but you can listen to it and hear what it sounds like. Just have a look at the score and then yeah, you'll be able to see what I've done. A lot of this is just using the one, the four and the five. Um, we could probably have been a bit more adventurous with the harmony, but if you're just doing cross starting out, then if you stay to the one and the four and the five, you will be fine, and you will get a, you will get a passing grade <laughs> in your exam. Um, so yeah, I think I'll probably um, yeah I think I'll probably call it here. I've kind of covered what I need to do. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining me, Jatin. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, just leave me a comment uh, if you've got anything you want me to cover in future installments. You know, I'm uh, uh, open to suggestions for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, just I've got a question from Mark. Sorry, I only just saw this. What app are you using? Uh, if you mean for the streaming, I'm using an app called OBS, Open Broadcasting System, I think it's called. For my um, uh, conference call with Jitin, I'm using Zoom. And my software is Sibelius. And then I've got my keyboard connected to it. And that is basically what I'm using. Uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, I'll see you.